we have a choice with our pain. We can either try to suppress it and ignore it. And if we do that, inevitably, we are going to end up taking it out on ourselves in the form of depression or something like that. Or we have the choice of being with it and acknowledging it. And by definition, it's not fun, but there's a way in which we can transform that pain into something else. That's the heart of the creative impulse for most creative people. They're like looking at something painful in their life. They're looking at their sense of longing and they're trying to turn it into something else and something more beautiful. All right, welcome back to the show, everybody. Today is gonna be awesome. And it's this lady and her work um, has been inspiring me and affecting me for a very, very long time. As an introvert, her work really resonates with me. And her latest book is called Bittersweet, How so Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole. And I got to tell you, this book spoke to me. I think you're going to learn a lot today about your emotions, about what is a good emotion or a bad emotion, and why do we label them that way? And I think you're going to learn a lot about yourself for many of us today and people that you love and maybe the way they think and operate in different ways. And so I cannot wait to have this conversation. I wish we had five hours with my guest today, Susan Kane. Susan, welcome to the show. And thank you so much. So great to be here with you. It is awesome to have you. And your other book, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, <clears throat> really affected me. And I think these topics are somewhat correlated. So let's let's define some terminology first okay, okay. Mm -hmm. so bittersweet that's sort of the main title what is bittersweetness i know what it is because i've read the book but i yeah. want to give the benefit to the audience so what's bittersweetness absolutely so you know we think we tend to think of bittersweetness as just like a moment in time right you know like you have a bittersweet experience at a child's graduation let's say or walking them down the aisle at a wedding or something and and that's true but bittersweetness is also a deeper state of mind. It's a, it's, it's a deep recognition of the way that in this life, joy and sorrow are always paired and that everyone and everyone we know is not here forever. You know, everyone we love best is here for an impermanent moment in time. Um, and that what comes from that recognition somehow, the more you're tuned into that recognition, the more you feel a kind of connection to creativity and human communion and even to transcendence. Um, there's a kind of deep state of joy at the beauty of the world that that comes from being in that state of mind. Amen. Yeah, and I right? felt this, I have felt this since I was a little boy and never had it explained or defined to me. And so when I introduced you and I said that your works deeply affected me, I really mean it because it's explained me to me in many different ways. In other words, I, I think my audience knows me so well by now, but <laughs> I do. I contemplate the end of life often, and it makes me live more richly in the present, in my opinion. And that contrast causes me to live richly. I love sad music. And ironically, yes, yes. makes me happy when I listen to sad music or just emotional music. And I think we feel like we're supposed to feel sad when we listen to these kinds of songs or have these kinds of experiences. But for so many of us, it actually brings us joy. And so it's, uh, it's so wonderful the way that you explain things in this book. And then we're going to go to some tactics and strategies, too, for everybody to help you, you know, better live if the fact that you kind of are wired like Susan and I are. So the other tandem with bittersweetness is this concept that we're all longing for something. Mm -hmm. And I so deeply believe that this is true. And so let's touch a little bit on longing and how it impacts all the areas of our life. Yeah. Um, and okay, I'm going to talk about longing in one second, but I just have to say that everything you just said, I can't tell you how much it made my day. I literally have goosebumps as I'm saying this because mm -hmm. like the, the thing you said at the beginning of like, oh my gosh, I've been feeling this all my life and never quite understood it. Yes. You know, it's like me too. And that's why I wrote this <laughs> book. I was like trying to figure out what the heck is this and what's this yeah. feeling that I have with sad music and why does it feel, why does it feel so deep and profound that I can't let it go. It wasn't just like an interesting intellectual question. It was like, I knew there was something really big there. I just didn't know what it was mm -hmm. until I started working on this book. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. So longing. Either until you wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. So, no. <laughs> um, so longing, I, I believe that you could call it spiritual longing. You could call it existential longing. If you, you know, to use secular terms, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Um, if, 
you know, whether you're an atheist or believer, not the point. At the core of the human experience is a kind of deep and existential longing for a place that we feel like we belong to that is more perfect, beautiful, good, true, uh, divine, if you want to call it that, um, than the world that we currently inhabit. And that's like, manif- we see that manifest in all our religions, the longing for the Garden of Eden and Zion and Mecca and the beloved of the soul. Um, but then we have all these other manifestations, you know, in Homer's Odyssey, it's like the longing for home. That's what sets Ulysses off on his journey. Uh, Dorothy, somewhere over the rainbow, she's longing for that place somewhere over the rainbow. There, there's thousands of, of expressions of this fundamental longing. And it's the best part of human nature. It's like, it's, it's our core. It is. And it's the acknowledgement that you have in the book that makes me feel so peaceful. And so I am a, I, I respect people of all faiths and all religions. Anybody who listens to my show knows this. I happen to be a Christian and I have always known that on all of us, there's this calling to want to understand our lives and the purpose of it and to get back to this place that's better than here. Yes. And this, I love, this may sound funny to everybody, but it didn't once I read Susan's book, like I love rainy days. Mm-hmm. I love it when it's even a little bit right now it's overcast. I live at the beach. It's an overcast day. And people think I'm strange sometimes where I go, I actually love the overcast days better than the bright sunny days. And I found that some people think I'm crazy, but the majority <laughs> of people I meet go, you know what? Me too. And when I listen to sad music and ironically, the, the contrast, the duality, somehow the complexity of both emotions. And so why are we starting the show with this? Because I think the overall premise here is that it's okay to embrace these thoughts and these emotions and it, it enriches our lives. Whereas culture, and I'll let you speak to this society sort of tells us to avoid and to suppress these supposedly negative emotions. I write in my new book, the power of one more. I don't think there are positive or negative emotions. They're just our emotions. Mm -hmm. I also think maybe the, an overabundance of one or the other can become unhealthy to some extent. And you write about that as well, but just speak to that again about it's okay to embrace these other states of being to enrich in our, our overall life experience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we actually found, you know, from the different research that I did for the book, um, that this state of mind that you're talking about, you know, the love of rainy days, love of sad music, all these things, um, it is, it is intrinsically connected to states of creativity. It is connected to a sense of human bonding. It's connected to a sense of transcendence. And yeah, and as you say, yes, we are living in a culture that is telling us not to go there because we're supposed to be so cheerful and upbeat all the time. You know, to use your metaphor of weather, like you're you're only supposed to admit to liking sunny days. It's like, right. as you say, it's seen as weird to, why would you like an overcast cloudy day? What, what's wrong with you? And that's cutting us off, not only from the truth of our emotions, but from some of our, the best parts of ourselves, the best parts of ourselves. That's the, that's the crazy part of it. I agree. And you also talk about, and I've been talking a lot about this myself. I don't know if it's my age or stage of life, but imagine a world you say in the book with no sadness loss or suffering. And what we think we would want in a world like that is, oh, we would just all be happy all the time. But you submit sort of a different belief system about that. If there was never any sadness or loss or suffering, what do you think the world would be like? Well, I have to say this one's a complicated question because, I mean, no one is giving me this magic wand, but if I had a magic wand and, you know, we're, we're offered the chance to remake the world without sadness, loss or suffering, honestly, I'd probably do it. So my point is not like, yay, sadness, yay, suffering at all. My point is more that this is the world that we live in. The world Mm -hmm. that we live in is a world that contains joy and sorrow, you know, sadness and happiness, light and dark, all of it. That's, that's our world. And in that, so first of all, to be able to look at the truth of that world and speak the truth is a huge thing in and of itself. Mm-hmm. And in that world that we have, it so happens that being attuned to life's fragility has all these other um, benefits to it. You know, that it, it, it connects us, first of all, because the fact is we're all in it together. You know, we're all in the same str- strange state of exile from the Garden of Eden. We just are. Yep. And uh, and the fact that you're in exile and I'm in exile and so is everybody listening, there's no greater bond than that, really. 
And that is, you just nailed it. I love it. That is what bonds us together. And I think that why I think this is so important, why I wanted to cover it early in the conversation was that I feel like people who think if they do experience sadness or they do experience some form of suffering or melancholy or even anxiety or fear, that somehow now they're disqualified from the other emotions that I'm not supposed to have any, if I have any pain or I have any suffering or sadness, that means I also can't be happy, blissful, passionate, or have right. ecstasy in my life. Right. And that's a great lie. That's it's absolutely not true. Correct. 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 Yeah. It's like, I, I actually off, often think on the top, this topic and on all topics, if everyone could just embrace the idea, both these things are true. Like two things can be true at the same time. Yes. We'd all be so much better off um, with our politics, with everything. But anyway, um, so right. we can be and are happy and sad. That's just, that is the nature of life. And some people do, you know, tend more to the cheerful and some people do tend more to the gloomy, but that doesn't matter for all humans. We experience it all. You say that the way we meet our pain defines who we are. And I want you to elaborate on that. I've been saying lately that, you know, on the other side of temporary pain, oftentimes we get introduced to another self. Napoleon Hill says that in Think and Grow Rich. And I find that when I speak about pain, so when I speak about winning and competing and achievement, I get incredible responses from people. Mm -hmm. But when I speak about pain and suffering and even death, and that, you know, that it will come for us at some point, I've been speaking a lot lately about my father's passing, that the depth of emotion, the depth of the energy, the depth of the feeling is maybe a hundred times greater yeah. when I touch on those topics than just the good stuff of winning and competing and achievement. So what do you mean when you say the way we meet our pains defines who our pain defines who we are? We have a choice with our pain, which comes into every life. And the choice is we can either try to suppress it and ignore it. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, inevitably, we are going to end up taking it out on ourselves in the form of depression or something like that, mm -hmm. or on the people around us. Or we have the choice of being with it and acknowledging it. And it's not fun by definition. It's not fun. Um, but there's a way in which we can transform or like try to transform that pain into something else. I mean, I, I think that's, that's the heart of the creative impulse for most creative people. They're like looking at something painful in their lives. They're looking at their sense of longing and they're trying to turn it into something else and something more beautiful. Um, is, there, is there a practical thing you can do every day to do that? In other words, when you are feeling these emotions of, I don't know, for me, it's not always pain. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just like melancholy or um, I think that's the right word for it for me. Sometimes it's this melancholy feeling about things that I enjoy sitting in for a while. Mm -hmm. I do, but is there a, a strategy that you use? Oh, there is, because there's a bunch in the book, but is there one thing you would say to someone who says, maybe I'm, Maybe I'm ODing on melancholy and well, I need to turn it into something powerful. I mean, I guess the question is, are you talking about being in a state of mind where you are enjoying it and grieving on it? In which mm -hmm. case, I don't think you need to do anything differently. Like when you're in that state of mind of like, oh, you know, the sky is so overcast and I'm loving this music, mm -hmm. that that's the state in and of itself that, to cultivate. Um, but if you're talking about, well, I'm in a state where where the pain is actually really painful. That's mm -hmm. different. Um, and a great technique for that is um, something called expressive writing, which I talk about in the book. Yep. And, and it's basically just the sheer act of just writing down what you're feeling without any thought of publishing it or anything like that. Quite the opposite. You know, mm -hmm. Get it out, write it down, rip it up. Um, mm -hmm. And this is based on studies from a guy named James Pennebaker at UT mm -hmm. Austin. Yeah. He's done all these crazy studies showing how powerful the, the sheer act of writing things down is it, it improves your health. It literally lowers your blood pressure, improves your success outcomes in life, um, a greater sense of well being. So it's a way of, uh, it's a way of discharging what you're feeling, but also what you end up doing when you write it down is your sense making, you're like making sense of what's happening. Yeah. Um, and you're figuring out how you want to move forward with whatever has just caused you this pain. The reason I ask you that is because in the book, you sort of state this, this belief system that I agree with that maybe these are the emotional states of creativity. Mm -hmm. And that when we look at art, oftentimes it is born out of these sort of emotions. When we listen to music that really moves us, it's born out of them. Even comedy, 
ironically, yeah, very my favorite much so. thing. Most comedians are touching on something uncomfortable, painful, or the ironies of life. And so most art, why do I say this to everybody? Because I have the benefit when I experience these things, I create speeches that I give or books mm -hmm. that I write or podcasts that I'm going to do or content that I create. But a lot of people just sort of sit in these emotions. And you asked earlier, which is it for me? And I think most human beings would say this. It depends on the day. Mm -hmm. And it depends on how long. And so I want you to talk about this because I just want to ask you this personally. There's a point in time where I'm in these states of contemplating, you know, you say the fragility of life and mm -hmm. how you understand death has a lot to do with how you live. I'd like you to touch on that. Give you a long answer here. Give you a long runway. So there's that. And I do that a lot. Or, you know, just just allowing myself to sit in a state of just it doesn't always have to be 150 degrees of bliss all the time. Ed. Mm -hmm. It's OK to sit on a kind of misty day and just enjoy the gray a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, I think most people who have that proclivity predisposition or even disposition, which may be all of us, you can then sit in it a little too long though. And that's what I mean by the abundance of an emotion, right? Mm -hmm. There's a point where you're going, now I'm not creating out of this state. Now it's impacting me the other way where it paralyzes me yeah. or freezes me or, it makes me tired. It can even yeah. impact your energy level. So what would you say about all that? Yeah, um, these are amazing questions. So um, first of all, the, in, in terms of the, the creative idea, one of the things I say in the book is whatever pain you can't get rid of, make that your creative offering. And as you say, there, there's just so many studies and so many examples that I talk about of the ways in which creators do exactly that, you know, and it's not an accident that so many of our great creatives over time were orphaned before the age of 18, like an astonishing percentage of them lost one or both parents before yes. age 18, because that's what they're doing. Clearly, you know, they're figuring out how to take that ultimate longing that they're left with um, yeah. and turn it into something else. But to your other question of like, how do you know when it's just right or too much. It's a really important point because I, there, there's a kind of happy and creative state of melancholy that we were just talking about. And then mm -hmm. I think farther down that spectrum, you get to something that looks more like clinical depression, um, where you, it's very difficult to be creative when you're actually depressed. I mean, depression is more about like an emotional numbness and a hopelessness and a sense of disconnection, whereas the happy melancholy we were talking about, you're feeling intensely connected. So the thing to do is to sort of tune into where you are um, in mm -hmm. that spectrum, right? And mm -hmm. if you feel you're slipping towards something that resembles clinical depression, like that's a, that's a time to get help as opposed to um, only thinking, well, how can I, tr you can keep on trying to turn it into something else, but you also might need to be looking to outside resources for help. With what about, that. what about this Buddha? I think it's a Buddhist practice you talk about in the book mm -hmm. uh, called meta. Is that what it's oh, called? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. What is that? I think this is a tool that could be used by people it's sort of uh, in all situations, but maybe particularly the one that I'm discussing, if you could just get into that just for a second, because I think it's super powerful. Yeah, absolutely. So meta is a practice that basically means loving kindness meditation. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'm actually, by the way, I'm creating my own loving kindness meditation, which will be up on my website in the next month or so for people who are interested in doing my version of it. And, and that's susankane.net if you're curious, mm -hmm. but loving kindness meditation, it, it's basically a form of meditation in which you kind of actively and consciously wish well-being, peace, you know, good things, love to, well, interestingly, Classically, you, you first wish it to yourself. Okay. And then after that, you wish it to people who you know very well, um, to acquaintances. Ultimately, you wish it to the difficult people in your, in your life. You kind of like move outward from there. What's interesting is for a lot of Americans, they have a lot of trouble beginning with wishing these good things to themselves. So very often people need to turn it upside down and wish it to other people first before they feel comfortable getting around to their own selves. There's no magic though. You can do it in either direction. My um, favorite time in church, I was raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. My favorite time in church. And when you're a little kid in Catholic church, there's a lot of stand up, sit down, kneel. You know, we're going to say the Our Father. There's a lot of repetitive nature to the service. And um, my favorite part of church on Sundays was the one little moment where you get to turn to your neighbor and say, peace be with you. 
Oh yeah. And I loved that part of church. In fact, I miss it because I don't go to that church any longer. And my dad said to me when I was a little guy, and this is even when my dad was drinking because he was still a really good man. He goes, you know, I do that quietly all the time when I pass strangers. I said, what do you mean, dad? And he goes, oh, when I pass someone, like I open a door, I'm in an elevator. I'll just quietly say, peace be with you. I wish you peace. And he said, even when people walk by us in restaurants, Eddie, I'll do that. And and that's a practice that I've I've had all my life because a lot of times with parents, things are caught, not taught, right? Yes. One of the th- greatest gifts I give myself all the time is uh, my quiet prayers when I see somebody. I'll even see a family at the table and just say, peace be with you. And just that feeling feels so good to connect with someone's yes. soul who may not even consciously know you're connecting with them. But I have this belief system that subconsciously, spiritually, from an energetic soul perspective, they do feel it. And so I love that you bring that up. I completely agree with you. I have total goosebumps listening to the fact that you do that. And um, and and I think not only from a soul perspective, even if you look at it just from a human evolution perspective, we are designed to pick up on each other's cues and we do it in a thousand ways that we're not even consciously aware of, which mm. is, so I think people would be picking it up, you know, um, yeah. from you saying that. I and that's too. exactly what practicing meta does. Like I notice whenever I, I, I'm not as good as I should be about doing this all the time, but I notice whenever I do practice it, you know, then I go out into the world and I'm just sort of like automatically doing some version of what yeah. you just said. Do you know why it works for someone like you and I and almost everybody listening? Because it's going to go to the other thing I want to talk about, which is that I'm an introvert. And some people say, don't ever label yourself as an introvert. No, I, I'm introverted. And I, I love that I'm introverted. And I wanted to, the reason I share this, what do you want to call a technique or strategy that my dad taught me? It's just really an act of kindness. It's not really a strategy. But it's also something an introvert can do because you don't have to say anything to give someone a prayer. So it's my yeah. my way of connecting with someone in the unspoken way. And I may never, I mean, there's the truth. I've connected with millions of people this way probably in my life that I've actually never spoken to. And what a, I think a, a much deeper connection than, hi, how are you? Good. Have a great day. I think much deeper connection is to say, peace be with you or you know, I, I wish you a beautiful day. I wish you bliss. Like I love saying that quietly to myself or another person. Don't you agree? Oh my gosh. I absolutely love it. And I am sure you're radiating, radiating something at them when you're doing it. Um, I feel that way too. I do uh, too. I'll, I'll give you another version of something like that, that I do. It's sure. almost like the flip side of what you just described. So yeah. I, I wrote in the book about um, this video that the Cleveland clinic put out that went viral Cleveland Clinic is a hospital, and the video was designed to um, teach empathy to their caregivers. And mm-hmm. so what this video did, it it like it takes you through the hallways of the hospital, and you're passing all these random people who you normally wouldn't think one way or another, except in this case, there are these little captions that are underneath each random person as you pass them by. And the captions tell you what the person is going through at that moment. And sometimes it's happy things like, you know, Mm. just found out he's going to be a father for the first time, Mm. but more often because it's a hospital, uh, the captions are things like, you know, under a little girl going to say goodbye to her father for the last time, like, Mm. like these heartbreaking things. You you cannot watch this video without tearing up. It's impossible. Mm. So once I saw this video, I started to do this practice where I just try to imagine what people's captions are as I pass them by, you know, oh, just in everyday I life. Love it. I love it. And I don't know the answers, but there's something about wondering what they are that makes you interact with them completely differently, you know, and care about them in a different way. I love you. I do that too. And I, 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 I sometimes, perhaps I'm making it up in my mind and I'm just going to say, so I've never said this before. I've never thought about it consciously to you just said it, but we get, everyone gets to listen to you and I talk about this, which is cool, right? <laughs> this is no longer a podcast. It's just you and I talking, but oftentimes, oh my gosh, this just confirms what you believe so much more deeply. It just dawned on me. I do do that quietly when I watch people or I'm in a place and it's harder and harder, the more well-known you are to do it intimately because someone sees you, then they know you. So that's a, it's a little harder than it used to be for me, but I do do it. And I also ironically sometimes sense their pain and I almost project a story onto them in my mind about what they are insecure or they feel invisible. Oftentimes, because I think these folks feel so invisible, this is my way of seeing them, even though 
maybe auditory wise, they don't know it. And so I actually, it makes me really even confirm your work even more because I don't usually picture them in their most blissful or happy state. Right. I picture them in their pain and their sadness. And that, that just must prove even more deeply. That's how we connect with one another. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're designed to do it, right? Like we, the species wouldn't survive if we couldn't look after helpless children who come into this world as crying infants. Like that's what we do. And uh, because of that, like that, that ability radiates outward from there. So, um, by the way, if people wonder whether this is true, give them this stat. See, if I'm a business person listening to this, like, okay, what's the business? I'll give you the research. Yeah. I, I, the business application of this is maybe you should stop always trying to connect with people on their victory and their wins and what you or your company can do for them, but begin to connect much more deeply with people, which is their pain and their anxieties and their fears and their story, their sadness. I think you'd find you'd connect a whole lot more deeper, even as a busy person, but give us the research, especially the one about the songs the, on the playlist. Oh yeah. Okay. Give um, us both. Okay. So the songs on the playlist, well, there's a lot to say about that. First of all, people whose um, favorite songs are sad songs like you, uh, well, we'll we'll start with the other way. People whose favorite songs are their happy, upbeat songs. They listen to them about 175 times. People like you who love the sad songs, 800 times. Crazy. And we also know that um, the songs that make people feel, you know, the chills and the goosebumps and the real feels, they're the sad songs. They're always the sad songs yeah. and people will say, this is what makes me feel connected to, you know, to the sublime, to the wondrous, to something outside myself. Mm -hmm. It's always the sad songs. Um, I love it. I love it. I I want everyone to know that. And by the way, you and I both always want to get the caveat. We like sunny days. Yes. We like happy songs too. It's just, we kind of have a tendency towards the other. So you're also going to talk about this research where I was talking about from a business standpoint, I think you're going to kind of confirm some of that research. Oh yeah. Well, what I wanted to say about like people connecting to each other through their sadness. So like there's this amazing psychologist whose story I tell in the book, his name is Dacher Keltner. Um, And he, he's done all this groundbreaking research proving what he calls the compassionate instinct in people and compassion. What it literally means that word is with sorrow, like with suffering. So it means, you know, you're reacting to somebody else's pain or distress the way you were just saying. So he's, he's located this in our bodies, basically. Um, like if you, yeah, just one example, and there's a, a whole bunch of them, but we have a, what's called a vagus nerve. It's the biggest um, bundle of nerves in our bodies it governs our breathing and our digestion. So it's mm. very fundamental to who we are and to our survival. And also when you see another being in pain, your vagus nerve becomes very activated. Interesting. Yeah. So it's like the same nerve that's helping you breathe is mm. also telling you to respond to the pain of the person to whom you've just wished well in the grocery store. Um, oh, like that, that's how we're designed. I love it. I just think everyone, maybe this could give you a different perspective on how you interact and view humans and one another. Just this little, I don't think even Susan, you know how big this theory is and that I'm validating as a truth. Because I think taken to its logical extension would change the way that humanity interacts with one another, how we treat one another, our religious and political differences, our, you know, our, there's, are slight nuances that make us different. This is this is what would connect people in a much more kind way. It would give leaders of companies and teams and businesses and countries a completely different perspective on how to lead and connect with people and bring them together. So I love, love this work. I have to share something with you about this connecting with people with their pain, and it'll take me a minute, but my audience knows some of this, but here's how correct your work is. The, my dad was an alcoholic and a little bit of a drug addict. And the biggest decision of my lifetime was my dad getting sober and he stayed sober for the rest of his life, like 35 years. But about three weeks ago, I read your book because I knew we were going to do this. And the next night, Susan, I just want to share with you how profound this work is and these thoughts are for everybody. So I read your book. I read it in a sitting. And that night I went to bed. Oh, excuse me. The next night when I went to sleep, I had this vivid dream of something I didn't realize that I'm 51 years old. And that is that someone helped my dad. And some precious soul stepped forward and helped my father get sober in the darkest moment of his life when he was losing his family, maybe losing his life. And some precious human connected with my dad and changed my family forever, changed my great grandchildren. People listening to this, you wouldn't be listening to this. 
And guess how he connected with my dad? Through their shared pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. That person was also an alcoholic, also a drug addict. They knew the shame. They knew the fear. They knew the embarrassment. They knew the frustration. They knew the depression that came with the, the patterns of behavior. Had that person connected with my dad through bliss and sunshine and rainbows or their own perfection, their own lack of pain, they would have never been able to help my father. They reached my dad through connecting, through shared suffering, through shared pain. And then from there said, here's how I can help you. So from every perspective in life, the connecting point is here. And then how I can help you. Isn't that a great example? Oh my God. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing example. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think I don't have that dream if I don't read your book the day before. (laughs) I don't because it opens up. That's why art, this podcast, it'll just... I guarantee everybody, there's millions of people listening to this, driving in their car on the treadmill or with their family. They're looking at the person, the next person they see just a little bit differently, looking in the back seat Mm -hmm. at their babies. And they're looking at someone at the grocery store and they're going to think about their friends differently. And this, this is where change comes from. The other thing though, I have to ask you about. I I I just want to say, I totally agree. And I, I have thought this before about like our hopelessly divided Mm -hmm. politics and culture and religion, everything that I think what we should be doing is figuring out spaces for people just to be able to share their stories and share the pains that they've gone through without it being connected, at least temporarily, without it being connected to any call for policy change or or a political agenda or anything like that, just for people from different backgrounds, from red, from blue, from everywhere to just tell their stories. That's it. I love it. I, I, I actually believe that, um, you know, I get asked sometimes about ever run for office, and I that's highly unlikely. But I do believe that that's where uh, change comes from. It's just saying, just please hear me and listen to me. And then you can reach your own conclusions. It's when they think that there's a hook coming or a pitch or a close or a, is something we want you to do is when people are turned off. And I think if you just say, just please hear me. You know, whatever you believe about guns or no guns or school security or mental health, whatever the issues are to hear some of these parents that just had this tragedy happen in Texas and just to hear their pain, just, Mm -hmm. just hear them. Many of them have differing views themselves on what should be done about it, but you would reach a more beautiful and correct conclusion. If you just listened to people and heard their pain and heard their suffering. Now I want to talk about being an introvert. Okay. Cause 'cause, cause I, cause it's all linked together for me. Do you think someone is born an introvert? Number one, And why is there power in introverted people? Oh, gosh. Um, I think many people are born with a temperament that predisposes them to introversion, but you can't say that for every one person. I mean, what we know is it's one of the more heritable of all the personality traits, but Mm -hmm. there's no such thing as anything that's all nature or all nurture. Um, But we definitely know that there's a lot of babies who are born into this world with um, a kind of more sensitive nervous system, which Mm -hmm. makes them react more to all the different stimuli that come their way. Mm -hmm. So when those babies are two years old and you put them in a play group of kids they've never seen before, they're going to experience that as an overstimulating event. So those kids are going to react like, Mm -hmm. you know, they're going to, they're going to clam up Mm -hmm. until they start to process all the different stimuli and feel like, okay, now I can join in. Um, so yeah. And then there's other kids who are born with a temperament where they don't notice any of that stuff. And so they can just plunge right in right away. Why'd you call it the power of introverts? I I, I, that was interesting where my book's called the power of one more. I'm like, there's a common theme here, but what, why is it the power of introverts? Um, because I, I see introversion just the way I see, you know, bittersweetness as we were just talking about, I see them both as kind of hidden superpowers, you know, hidden in, a, in because we live in a culture that wants everything to be extroverted and cheerful. Um, mm-hmm. but like with introversion, the power is that if you are spending more time in quiet, which you're going to be doing by just virtue of your nature, um, you're by definition going to be spending more time listening because you're not as interested in talking. You, you want to be listening more. Um, you're going to be spending more time in, in states of deep focus um, or it, you're, the, the creative process itself involves solitude. We tend to think of it now as this big, you know, 
festive collaborative activity. And it is partly that, but we know that creativity actually can't happen without some element of solitude, which if you're an introvert, just comes that much more naturally to you. Mm. Um, and then there's also the, the less expected powers, like even when it comes to leadership, where people really expect introverts would be at a disadvantage. Um, yet if you look at the data, introverted leaders deliver outcomes that are as good as, or in some cases better than extroverts, in part because, well, partly because of that listening tendency, but also because introverts are more likely to um, be seeking out the, what the people they lead have to offer, like hearing from them, finding out what those things are, and then running with those ideas. Whereas if you have a personality that's more dominant, um, more irrepressible, you're going to be running with your own ideas much more just because that's your nature. It, it, it doesn't come from conceit. It just comes from like a, you know, put a, a tendency to put your own stamp on things. Yeah. Have you made any connection? You're so right. Between someone who maybe sits in that state of, um, I don't know what you want to call it, reflection, sadness, sorrow, whatever that state might be, and being introverted. Do you think there's a connection between those two things at all? Oh, well, this is so interesting. Okay. So in the bittersweet book, you saw there's, there's a yep. quiz that you can take it's and so it's on good. my website too, if, yep. for people who want to just do it quickly, yep. um, take like two minutes, you find out yep. how prone you are to the state of bittersweetness. Okay. So then we took the quiz and saw what the correlations were. And I expected that there would be a high correlation with introversion and there wasn't, but the high correlation was with a different related sort of cousin state to introversion called high sensitivity, mm -hmm. which is a state that Elaine Aaron, um, the psychologist discovered. Um, and, and if you're a highly sensitive person, you basically react that much more intensely to everything that life throws your way. Um, so the, the beautiful sunsets are going to feel that much more beautiful to you. Uh, an upsetting experience with a colleague, a conflict with a colleague is going to probably hurt you that much more or upset you that much more. That's the state of sensitivity. And there seems to be a really strong correlation with sensitivity and bittersweetness. I love it. Why am I talking about this at length so much, guys? I'd like you all just to embrace this part of you, or at least be open to the fact that you may have more of it than you realize. Maybe you've been programmed to just anytime sadness comes, suppress it. Anytime pain comes, suppress it or frustration. Even loss, I mean, and loss can be a loved one. Loss can be someone said an unkind word to you. Loss can be you missed a sale today in a business. This is loss. And how you respond, you asked this question in the book, I'd like you to answer it too. What do you do when pain comes? And that's a powerful question. Everyone should be asking themselves too. But what do you, what should someone do when pain comes? Susan, what would you say? That's a tough, tough question. Yeah. And I mean, it, I, I, I think that one really does depend on the nature of the pain and on the person involved um, because everybody responds so differently to these kinds of things. You know, mm -hmm. like I just went through, I, I just went through a succession of bereavements, right? During COVID, I lost my father and my brother. Oh so, um, wow. I'm so sorry. Oh, I mean, thank you. Wow. Um, and for me, I was like, partly because I'm an introvert, I guess, but I'm sure it's other things too. Like I, I really wanted to process all of that pretty privately and I turn it into creativity pretty quickly. Like I start writing things down. Um, but then my literary agent, my very beloved literary agent, he, he lost his wife to ALS um, not long after. Mm. And for him, he's been doing this series, like all his clients have come together and we do we get together with him for virtual zoom sessions. It started out as a memorial service, but now we do it like every week or every two weeks. Wow. And, um, and he says a prayer and we talk together and, and for him, that's like incredibly sustaining through his pain. Mm. So I think it really is a matter of turning into what each individual heart needs and not expecting that there is going to be one cure all way to go. Yeah. But as it comes to grieving, you actually say in the book, I told you, I read every page over and over mm -hmm. You talk about in grieving that oftentimes it's, again, it's the same sort of societal bias against these sorts of emotions, mm -hmm. but Hey, let it go. You know, right. right? Like with, as if sitting with grieving or some pain or discomfort is such a terrible thing. You talk about using those terminology, that terminology, that this soon will pass, you know, and 
you let it go or these other things with grieving and you say, well, hold on a minute. What would you say about that? Yeah. So let it go to me. Let it go. It's a very complicated concept really, because I do find a lot of sustenance in it. And at the same time, there's something in that phrase of let it go. That's a kind of like more polite version of move on, you know, get over it, get over it. Um, and, And I think what we need to do is not get over it until we're ready to get over it. Um, (laughs) and the great news is for many people, um, we actually are way more, we know this from research where most people are way more resilient to grief than we expect we're going to be, although it never goes away completely. Um, Mm -hmm. and then some people are not. So there's, there's a different formulation that I talk about in the book that I like better than let it go. And this one comes from the writer, Nora McInerney, and she talks about the difference between moving on and moving forward Mm -hmm. and moving on is kind of like, get over it already, (laughs) you know, just get on with your life. Moving forward is much more the idea that you are going to go ahead with your life, but you're going to carry with you forever, the person who you've lost. And you're, Mm -hmm. you're going to carry that grief with you to some degree forever as well, but your life is going to go on as you carry that person with you. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you're, you're not asking yourself ever to have to leave that person behind or even to leave your grief behind, but there's a way of, there's a way of kind of having both of moving forward, forward with your life while you carry that person with you. Yeah, and and I'll say, that. yeah, like this is something I've really, I've noticed this with my father, like, you know, like in the time right after I lost him, like there was, there were just like a million times where I would think, Oh, I want to call down and tell him about such and such. Yeah. And I don't do that as much now, but there is a sense of like carrying him with me. Like he's the one who taught me to love music so much and I'll mm. listen to music and be with him. Mm. It, it's in a different way though. It's, it's in a moving forward type of way, but I'm I carrying him with me. I like, I like this moving forward instead of moving on. That's yeah. also true in relationships. We grieve a lot of things, not just the passing of people. We can grieve a relationship. And I have a really good girlfriend of mine who all of our friends keep telling me, you need to let it go. Just let them go. Rear view mirrored. Stop it. Who, don't even think about it anymore. You know, that's the typical advice. And uh, so she and I were talking and I go, well, I don't agree with that. <laughs> and I said, there's some, there's some beauty in grieving the relationship. There's also some lessons in that grieving that you might need to carry with you. And I said, sister, I've known you a long time. You keep dating the same dude. It's just with a different name. (laughs) It's the same guy. And that's because from every relationship, you just moved on. Well, what she needs to do is move forward Mm -hmm. and carry some of the lessons of what she's looking for. And maybe more importantly, what she's not looking for in her relationships. And without some grieving and reflection, you don't learn those lessons if you just drop it all together. Yeah. And I, I think that, um, we have such a circumscribed understanding of what grief is. I think this is what you keep getting at with these questions and and psychologists even talk about this and they call it disenfranchised griefs, you Mm -hmm. know? So we're like, we're, we're, we're pretty much okay with the idea that bereavement, like flat out bereavement is something that's worthy of grieving though. Even there, we want it to last for five minutes and then be done. But, um, but when it comes to other kinds of griefs, like the ones you're talking, you know, breakups or like financial worries, or mm-hmm. someone said something mean to you online or whatever it is, mm-hmm. like those are griefs also that we need to be dealing with as such. Um, and yeah, like thinking about your friend, if she could go into an actual morning and figure out what she is, what did, what did she lose before she ever even met the first of those boyfriends? You're right. What did she lose first? Because that's what she's still trying to reclaim. Yeah, everything, there's a lesson in it. And if you just move on or you're just in bliss and you're just partying and celebrating all the time, perhaps one of the things that robs you from is the lessons in life that can create a much more deeper level of happiness and bliss, a deeper relationship or a better business so that we grow from it. So I, I, I just love this. So, okay. Someone runs into you tomorrow and they said, I heard you on Ed Milet's show. I cannot believe how profound this work is. I've never heard anything like this before. And I wish you he would have asked you X, Y, or Z. What did I not ask you today about your work that I should have asked you? 
Oh gosh, that's such a hard yeah. question. I know. Well, that's why oh. I'm giving it to you because I'm thinking <laughs> I've got my part. I pull from the book, the things that I, you know, that I want to learn, but is there a tactic or a strategy in the book or a thought process about this overall topic that I just did not ask you? Okay. So, you know, as soon as we hang up, I'm going to think of the one that I super wanted to tell you, but, <laughs> but, but, but this is a big one that I'm about to say. So as you know, um, part of what I did in the book was I really looked at a lot of different wisdom and religious t- traditions to understand what they had to say about this bittersweet nature of life. And there are so many amazing things, but there's one parable that comes from the Kabbalah, which is the mystical side of Judaism. And knowing this one parable has helped me so much to live with the way in which this world has so much joy and so much suffering. And like, how do you live with those two things together? Mm. Okay. So the, it's like a metaphor. And the idea is that, that all of creation was originally one intact divine vessel, but that the vessel shattered and that the world that we're living in now is the world after the shattering. So it's the broken world, mm. but, but it's not totally broken. It, it, it's, it's not complete gloom because this world has, we have scattered all around us the shards from that broken, but divine vessel. So there are these shards of light scattered all around us and we're all going to notice different ones. So you're going to, you're going to spot different ones from the ones that I would, but our job in this life is just to bend down and pick them up wherever we find them, just bend down and pick them up. And that's it. So it's not to say we're going to get to perfection because I, I actually think that the, the expectation of perfection or utopia on this earth is incredibly destructive. So it's mm-hmm. putting utopia to the side. It's just saying they're, there, there are glimpses of it so and train good. your eyes on them. Oh my gosh. That's so good. Susan. I think that you are part of that light in the world. You have been for me. Very rarely have I read something or experienced someone's work that so deeply helped me understand myself better and affected me deeply. And I know that this is a different topic than what people are used to hearing on every podcast they're on. And I think it may be one of the most important ones I've ever had because of the ability to connect with yourself differently and also connect with other people. And that just makes you a better person, a better husband, wife, parent, business person, person of your faith. These things really, really matter to you. Susan, I think you're a remarkable woman with with such a kind heart. And I love that you're definitely an introvert as we're connecting here. I connect with you on that level. And you've shown your power because this book is absolutely incredible. And so are you. So thank you for today. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Ed. I mean, like such a joy to be able to talk to you. And I'm sure all your guests feel this way after they talk to you, but I really do hope we can stay in touch because uh, it's amazing to talk and to connect. I love that. I would love that. And uh, I'll give you my word that we'll do that. So, hey, everybody, today is special. And I hope that you have already thought of a person or two that you'd like to share this with, share this episode with. And I'd encourage you to do it right now because I think it'll deeply affect them and help them understand themselves the world, maybe the both of you together with one another. So please share this. Go get Bittersweet from Susan Cain, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole, and go pick up my book, The Power of One More, which is the number one book in the world right now. Please go pick that bad boy up as well. All right, God bless you. You're amazing. Take care, everybody. Max out. 